Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome uh, to Freeway again this morning. This, uh, unfortunately, for me at least, is my last service here among you. Um, So let me begin by saying thank you for such uh, warm hospitality. It's been really wonderful to get to be here for five weeks. Um, And uh, so I I feel very privileged to have have been able to do that uh, for this time. So thank you. Uh, Next week, Graham Semple, who is one of the BUV's regional pastors, will be here preaching from the book of Matthew. And uh, I spoke to him this week, and uh, he's also really excited to be here. He called to say, uh, you know, are they they still nice? Are they still friendly? And I said, yeah, most of them, most of them. Uh, This morning, though, we're going to be continuing on in the book of Luke, looking at this parable of the Good Samaritan. And now this is my absolute favorite part of Luke's gospel, so I'm going to try to keep it under an hour. Um, If I don't manage it, I'm sure no one has anywhere else you need to be. Indulge me. Um, I'll try to keep it brief. But there is a lot to unpack here. Um, And I'm not sure what your experience of this passage might be, but I've often heard it preached as a lesson around uh, care for others. Something along the lines of how uh, the Good Samaritan embodies the way in which we too should be caring for our neighbors, self-sacrificing, generous, going over and above what's expected. Uh, And these things are all true, but It's not the point of the parable. What Jesus is communicating here is far more offensive to the people that are gathered uh, than we often realize. So we're going to follow the same structure as we have the last few weeks. We're going to spend some time in the text, and then we'll wrap up these five weeks thinking about the systems that we have embedded in the church and how effectively they work to welcome people into God's hospitality, which is uh, the message that sits at the very core of Luke's gospel. So, yet again, we find Jesus among a group of people. Because the man who speaks to him stands to ask his question at the start of the the passage, the assumption is that he was sitting because Jesus was teaching. In the NRSV, the man is described as an expert in the law, but if you're looking at other versions, it might describe him as a lawyer, which is a, a little bit confusing for a modern audience because what this man did Uh, is is quite different from the job of a modern lawyer. Suffice to say that he was an expert in Jewish religious law, which is found in the first five books of the Bible, what we might call the Pentateuch, but uh, what Jews call the Torah. This man would have been a part of the religious elite, a leader in the temple system, uh, part of a group of people that we tend to villainize when we read scripture today. The Pharisees, Sadducees, the scribes, the legal experts were all just people. Some of them received Jesus with open arms, but others refused to relinquish the power that they had through the temple system. And we find the same thing today. Those with much to lose through following Jesus tend to be more reluctant to follow him. Which is part of the reason why I think we don't see scores of people coming to faith in Australia in the way that we do in other parts of the world. We generally have too much to lose. So this man is just a person whose intention here is to test Jesus, we read in the text. Perhaps maliciously, but more likely just to see if his reading of the law is similar to his own reading, to the reading of the leaders of the temple at the time. So he asks Jesus in verse 25, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus puts the question back on him, which is something that we see Jesus do a lot. So Jesus responds, what is written in the law? What do you read there? And this man's response shows his knowledge of the law. We read in verse 27 that he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. Which is a saying that we're quite familiar with as modern Christians. But at the time, it was a really savvy summary of of quite a lot of law from Deuteronomy and Leviticus. Australian Bible scholar Leon Morris tells us that his response implies that one should love God with all that one is. The whole of human nature is included. The lawyer clearly had a deep insight into the scriptures when he could sum up the law in this way. And so Jesus says to him, you've given the right answer, do this and you will live. And now, you or I might leave the conversation there. We got the answer that we were after. Um, But Indian biblical scholar Takatemjan Ao believes the man had lost face by asking a question to which he knew the answer. 
And so to regain control of the conversation, he asked Jesus, now who is my neighbor? And the question isn't necessarily a stupid one or, or especially facetious. Uh, Leviticus 19, 17 to 18 tells us that you shall not hate in your heart any one of your kin. You shall reprove your neighbor or you will incur guilt yourself. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against any of your people, but you shall love the neighbor as yourself, for I am the Lord. Hong Kong theologian, theologian Diane Chen writes that the implication of this passage is that a person's horizontal relationship with other people grows out of and is indicative of his or her vertical relationship with God. The lawyer does not quibble about loving God, but the issue of loving one's neighbor is ambiguous. The definition of a neighbor presupposes the existence of a non-neighbor. Such a boundary simultaneously excludes as well as includes. Although Leviticus goes on to say that this law applies to foreigners as well as to Jews, in Jesus' day, the definition of neighbor is very narrow. It definitely doesn't include Gentiles or non-Jews and definitely not Samaritans. Chen helps us understand what's meant here a little better when she writes, Among the Jews, the religious elite will not accept as neighbors those who fail to keep the law as scrupulously as they do. The mentality to hate sinners is prevalent. The book of Tobit reads, place your bread on the grave of the righteous, but give none to sinners. Similarly, the book of Sirach contains this, give to the devout, but do not help the sinner. The lawyer has in mind a particular definition of neighbor that concurs with his sense of self-righteousness. And Luke is already hinting toward Jesus' answer in his word choice here in the Greek. Uh, he uses, uh, the, the term that he uses means more than the person who just lives near to you. It has in mind community and fellowship. Ultimately, the question puts us in mind of the point of Luke's gospel. How far does the hospitality of God extend? So Jesus replies with a parable. And his parables always kind of make me laugh because it makes me think he must have been kind of hard to be around. Like the disciples sit around and are like, yeah, we're thinking Jesus, uh, maybe we'd do like fish for dinner. What do you think? And Jesus would go, well, there was once a woman who had seven sons and seven daughters. And I'd be like, just be more easy. Please be more straightforward. But this parable is a really important one because it gives us an insight into what Jesus is doing in the world, as well as providing a strong challenge for us today. Jesus paints us a picture of a man traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho, which is about a 30 kilometer trip. It has a descent of about a kilometer, so it's, it's fairly steep going. The road is twisty and remote and rocky. And I'm sure the road has probably been improved sometime between the first century and today. Um, but I looked up walking directions on Apple Maps from Jerusalem to Jericho. And it says today it's nearly a seven hour walk. Uh, so I imagine maybe it was a bit longer back in the day. In Jesus' day, the road is famously a place where people will be robbed. It's a very twisty road. And so uh, people can hide in the bends and jump out and rob you. So it's really no surprise to Jesus' audience to hear that the man fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and took off, leaving him half dead. The Greek word that Luke uses to describe the man being half dead only occurs here in all of Scripture. So we really don't know how, how dead is half dead. We don't know how injured he is, but presumably he's severely injured. And Jesus continues, now, by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. Here again, these two religious leaders are often upheld in the modern church as villainous figures. But that wouldn't have been the way that Jesus' audience would have heard this story. Both the priest and the Levite would have been experts in the law too. And, and this is what the Torah has to say about this situation. Numbers 19, 11 to 13 reads, Those who touch the dead body of any human being will be unclean seven days. They shall purify themselves with water on the third day and on the seventh day and so be clean. But if they do not purify themselves on the third and on the seventh day, they will not become clean. 
All who touch a corpse, the body of a human being who has died, and do not purify themselves, defile the tabernacle of the Lord. Such persons will be cut off from Israel. The man lying on the road here may well appear dead, in which case taking too close a look at the body is risky for the priest and for the Levite. Because it's not only the body alone that's unclean, but also the air above it and even its shadow. So for this reason, and because of their high office, priests are forbidden from touching a dead body. Other issues are at play here too. You might remember um, a couple of weeks ago, we talked a bit about the high priority that's placed on the burial of the dead uh, in Judaism. It takes precedence over most other religious or familial obligations. A Jewish person must bury a fellow Jew if there is no one else to do so. But this rule doesn't apply if the body belongs to a Gentile, someone who's not Jewish. The issue is, though, that in order to check whether the man is a Jew or a Gentile, the priest and the Levite would have to run the risk of becoming defiled. And again, all these laws can actually be overlooked in the case of saving a life. But once again, the priest and the Levite would run the risk of defilement if the man was already dead. On top of all of this, the question of personal safety arises. What if the robbers who attacked this man are still around somewhere? It's fair to say the priest and the Levite are both reasonably justified in their actions here. It may not be ideal, but they have followed the letter of the law. Now, if this parable followed the rules of traditional ancient Jewish storytelling, the third figure in the story should be a regular Jewish layperson. We see this format all throughout the Hebrew Bible. Chen tells us that to have a good Jewish commoner outperform two temple offices would make a delightful story. For even though the religious leaders were respected, the gap in wealth, privilege and status between them and the populace was sometimes a source of envy and resentment. But the parable doesn't follow this format, and the third person is a Samaritan. Australian biblical scholar Brendan Byrne writes, centuries of holding together the adjective good and the noun Samaritan have dulled us to the, to the explosive tension of the phrase in the world of Jesus. The hostility between Jews and Samaritans at the time makes the phrase an oxymoron as a phrase like good terrorist would be for us. You'll remember from past weeks, the hostility between Jews and Samaritans runs centuries deep. The Samaritans are descended from those who were left behind when most of Israel Uh, was exiled by colonizing empires. They believed that they had faithfully maintained the correct ways of worshiping God. But when the wider diaspora, diaspora returned to the land, they insisted that worship take place on the temple mountain in Jerusalem rather than at Mount Gerizim. And this is the continued cause of hurt and hostility between Jewish and Samaritan communities today. You'll remember too that Uh, Jesus attempted to visit a Samaritan community on his way to Jerusalem and that they would have nothing to do with him. So we read in verse 33, but a Samaritan while traveling came upon him and when he saw him, he was moved with compassion. The Greek term that Luke uses here uh, to describe the Samaritan man being moved with compassion, he only uses otherwise to describe the acts of Jesus. So this is a serious level of compassion that we have on display here. From verse 34, we read, he went to him and bandaged his wounds, treating them with oil, which was believed to help numb pain and wine, which being alcoholic is an antiseptic. Then he put him on his own animal, which meant that the Samaritan man had to walk, brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper and said, take care of him. And when I come back, I will repay you whatever you spend. The Greek historian Polybius believes the rate or explains in his own writing that the rate of accommodation in his day, which was about 150 BC, so a little bit earlier, uh, that the Samaritan man is paying for something like two months accommodation. But we read too that the Samaritan man will also reimburse the innkeeper for anything he spends over and above this. The picture that we have is of someone going above and beyond what's expected of them. Because keep in mind, the same laws that prevent the priest and the Levite from helping the man also applied to the Samaritan. So Jesus concludes the story to, I imagine, a fairly shocked group of Jewish people. 
by asking, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? And the legal expert is forced to say, the one who showed him mercy. Though it seems that he's too disgusted by the man being a Samaritan to refer to him in that way. Jesus says to him, go and do likewise, leaving Luke's audience wondering what this man in the gathered crowd might have done next. Takatemjan writes, the real issue was not whether the expert could identify whether someone was or was not a neighbor, but whether he was acting like a neighbor. The man did not need a definition of neighbor. What he needed was love for his neighbor. Jesus thus changed the emphasis of the word neighbor from being an object of someone's love to being a giver of love, which we too must become. This shift in meaning is significant and requires personal reflection. Similarly, Byrne concludes, this is the way to inherit eternal life. In the ministry of Jesus, which the church has to continue, God offers extravagant, life-giving hospitality to wounded and half-dead humanity. The way to eternal life is to allow oneself to become an active instrument and channel of that same boundary-breaking hospitality. And this is all true, but what this parable exposes is that there were systems within the family of God that prevented the work of God from taking place and prevented those who should enjoy the hospitality of God from participating in it. Now, what I'm not trying to say here is that there was an issue with the Torah law as God had given it. You'll remember that Leviticus makes it clear that neighbor includes everyone in your local community, all the people in your surrounds, whether they be Jew or Gentile. But the way the family of God had interpreted God's instruction over time meant that it was no longer fulfilling its purpose. So I want to ask you this morning, in, in what ways have we as the church today built systems that inhibit the purpose of God? I would argue that there might be more than just a few. Last week, I got to spend a few days down at the BUV's Multicultural Pastors Retreat, which is my absolute favorite of all the events that they run. There were something like 120 leaders there representing a range of South, Southeast, and East Asian communities, as well as uh, Pacific Islander communities and a handful of Eastern European communities as well. I was there representing Whitley College, and so... Uh, was approached by people interested in studying with us and those who are currently students. And one student came to me distraught because she was really struggling with the workload of her study. She began by explaining that she's been in Australia for several years and she actually has a master's degree in accounting. Um, so she's not a lazy or a, a poor student. She's been studying part-time in order to manage the, her workload and still be able to care for her family, her children. Her issue was ultimately that it was taking her days and days to prepare for class every week because the lecturer was giving the class 10 or so readings a week and English was not her first language. For that reason, she was uh, you having to use apps and dictionaries to translate readings, sometimes line by line into her own language. And then sometimes finding that she didn't even know some of the words she was translating in her language, let alone in English. As it turned out, the lecturer was actually giving one or two long readings each week that were compulsory, but then also seven or eight optional ones. Um, and the idea was that students might look at those if they were interested or maybe if they had an assignment on that topic. He'd also offered the student help, but hadn't understood that there was too much cultural shame for the student around asking the lecturer for help and appearing like a bad or a lazy student. No one else had presented themselves as an appropriate or trustworthy person to ask, and so she had suffered in silence. This is a systemic problem in our college where students who happen to have learned English as their second or third or fourth or sometimes fifth language aren't being offered the support they need to be able to excel in their study. We've since discussed the issue in our academic committee, and we've made some steps toward changing the system to care for those who are currently marginalized by it. Similarly, here at Freeway, I've heard a lot of discussions about the staircase, which we know prevents some people from easily attending services here. As a church, you've discerned or reflected, as Takatemjan puts it, and determined that a lift will make the space more accessible so that all people can be a part of the generous and warm and hospitable community that meets here. 
and fundraising continues to make that a reality. But I wonder what other systems here might be preventative to people's full participation. As well as working at Whitley College, I also work at Nates, which is an indigenous theological college. And for many indigenous people, the church is not a safe institution. Historically, the church has been at the forefront, in this country at least, of the implementation of many exclusionary government policies, as well as the removal of children from their parents. While the Baptist church didn't necessarily run any missions, there was strong Baptist participation and funding going into non-denominational organizations that committed terrible sins against Aboriginal peoples. And this resulted in 1997 uh, with the Baptist Union of Victoria apologizing to Aboriginal peoples. They said this, we confess that our failure to see what we were doing denied our common humanity, degraded us all and was not Christian. For all this, we are truly sorry and apologize unreservedly. But for many Aboriginal Australians, not much has changed as a result. The church remains a place where stereotypes about their people run rampant and where they don't always feel welcome. For this reason, many churches within our union have begun to discern within themselves and take proactive steps to acknowledge traditional ownership in some permanent kind of fashion, often a plaque or a painting or something to that effect, as well as inviting indigenous Christians to come and speak and to lead in their churches. And now I'm not trying to make some veiled suggestion to the, the community here at Freeway, just to point out that our communities are full of blind spots, no matter how good or healthy they might be, or how well-intentioned our leadership is. Every community needs to stop from time to time and discern how their church community and how their systems operate and how they ensure that the greatest number of people are able to participate fully in worship, study, fellowship, prayer, ultimately participate in the hospitality of God. I can't speak to what these blind spots might be here at Freeway, but let me encourage you that the entire church has an ongoing obligation to make its spaces open and welcome to others. Dietrich Bonhoeffer famously wrote that the Holy Spirit only exists in two places. The first is inside the church, empowering its people for the ministry of reconciliation. And the second is outside the church, calling those who do not yet know Jesus into right relationship with God and into the church. What does it mean if our churches have systems in place that are preventative for people entering into them. In Luke 18, we read Jesus saying, let the children come to me and do not stop them, for it is to such as these that the, children, the kingdom of God belongs. And a parallel verse in Matthew's gospel reads, whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. So Freeway, let me conclude by saying that it's been a privilege to spend these five weeks with you. Let me commend the central message of Luke's gospel to you, that in Christ, the hospitality of God is open to all people. In the words of Brendan Byrne, those who make up the community of the kingdom are not a sect completely separate from the rest of the world, its structures and institutions. They must live in it and value what is best in it, holding out to it the hospitality that they themselves have received from God. Let's pray together. Loving God, we are grateful that you have brought us into your family. We're grateful that you have justified us, that you have ensured that we can have right relationship with you. We're grateful too that you call us now into ministry alongside you. And we pray that as people of the ministry of reconciliation, as people who know God and know the hospitality of God, that you would continue to help us uh, to create safe places and open spaces that show this hospitality to others in our communities. And we pray for your blessing as we reflect on what that might mean, what that might cost for us to do, and ask for your help in this and, and in all things. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.